Greg O'Gallagher. Man, you are one of the few people on the internet that stays like seven, eight, nine percent body fat year round. Like you and I have gone back and forth talking about sort of our different ways of of doing that and how we sort of maintain that. But I want to hear from you, man. What are your keys to staying lean year round? Yeah. So ultimately, I kind of develop the lens for staying lean, which is really it comes down to calories in versus calories out. So what I kind of realized this is when kind of staying lean, staying under 10% body fat became something I can do year round. Before it used to be a struggle. Uh, the lens that I started to look at was what's the most enjoyable way to eat at a small calorie deficit. So before there was all these different rules you have to follow, eat every few hours, do X, Y, and Z, low carb. And I just asked myself, what's the most enjoyable way for me to stay in a calorie deficit? And that's when I started to uncover intermittent fasting. So I started doing a short fast every day. The first five hours of the day, I wouldn't eat. That made it easier for me to stay in a calorie deficit. For me, I actually like to uh, save most of my calories for dinner. I like to have that bigger dinner feast. It makes me satisfied. I don't feel like I need to use tons of willpower to get lean when I can look forward to a big, delicious feast of steak, potatoes. So I try and create a diet setup that's very rewarding for me every day. Some people can eat small meals every few hours. For me, I feel like that, like that is brutal for me to do. So I like to do a short fast, eat a moderate sized lunch, a big dinner feast, and finally, I finish my calories off the last 400 with chocolate. And for me, like when I used to try and eat purely just healthy, clean food all the time, I would get cravings, I would overeat calories on healthy food. And when I get to have that little treat every night and my big feast, it's easy for me to stay in a calorie deficit um, year round. Or like at least when I'm cutting, I can stay in a calorie deficit for a few months, then go to maintenance. So the number one thing is finding a diet setup you can stick to. That's number one, okay? So for me, it's a short fast, moderate sized lunch, big dinner feast, a little dessert at night. That style is so easy for me to follow. Secondly, I like to eat the foods that satiate me the most. So potatoes I find are incredibly filling. Um, potatoes are insanely fill filling if you compare that to having rice or pasta. Um, russet potatoes really hit the spot. I like to eat lots of lean meat fruits, potatoes, and then again, a little bit of chocolate. So that's kind of what I build my diet off of, where I feel amazing and I feel satisfied and full. Um, those are really the main things. And I try to, when I cook at home, it's so much easier to stay lean when you can really cook. You can control how much oil and olive oil butter you're using. You can make the foods really filling. If you go to a restaurant, they overdo it. They make it extra tasty by using extra butter and oil. So it's much easier to stay lean if you're cooking um, as well, I like to eat the same, and this is what I find. If you look at, regardless of whatever someone's approach is, if they wanna eat more meals, if they do keto, if they do X, Y, and Z, one of the staples you notice with people that stay lean, they stay at 10% or less, is they tend to eat similar things day in, day out. They don't just have a different meal every single day for a month straight. They kind of, they find what works for them, they find what keeps them satisfied, what they feel full on, and they kind of stick to that. They have a little bit of variety, but they generally stick to eating the same thing, especially if, especially for the first meal of the day. Um, and so those are sort of my strategies. I don't like to do a huge deficit. I don't like to try and get lean too fast because then your leptin levels plummet, you get cravings, and it's hard to stick to then you mess up, you rebound. So I try and make the system so enjoyable, I can do it every single day, and then you get locked in, it becomes automatic. And so that's really a diet setup's probably 80% of it. And then to really make sure you, lo you lose fat at a good pace, I like to walk. I like to, 10,000 steps are good. Sometimes I'll push the envelope and do 12 to 14,000. And when you're walking, you're burning a moderate amount of calories. You're not increasing hunger. And so when you have the diet dialed in, you get lots of steps in, and then you just do the key lifts to maintain muscle. Getting lean is pretty, pretty automatic. So I want to back up to the, the restaurant thing for just a second, because you yeah. hit on a good point, because I know you're, you're on the road a lot. Yeah. So when you do eat out at a restaurant, like, how do you control that? Do you, uh, I mean, like personally, I. I usually have to be a little bit of a pain in the butt. I ask them, hey, like, can you, do you mind like cooking the eggs dry or, or like try to like cook it in little oil as possible? Half yeah. the time I find they do it, half the time they don't, half the time they put more oil on it because yeah. they just, they're like, a oh, pain in the butt. Like, what yeah. do you do when you're at a restaurant? Yeah, so I, if you're eating out at a restaurant three times a day, it's gonna be really hard. Um, I try and have that first lunch meal pretty 
well tracked. And so really I have to just make sure my dinner is dialed in. Um, if you go to a restaurant, especially if they have the calories on the menu, but they usually don't, but you'll notice very quickly that all those appetizers, all the starter salads are gonna be super high in calories. It's not gonna be worth it. If you wanna get the Brussels sprouts, you're looking at 500 calories. If you wanna get the salad, you're looking at 800. So a lot of times people go out to dinner and they wanna feel healthy. I'm gonna order the side of, uh, of, of Brussels sprouts, or I'm gonna start with the salad to feel healthy and you're just taking in extra calories. If you wanna eat veggies, you wanna make a salad, do it at home. Don't go to a restaurant, have a salad, a side of veggies, and then order you know, your entree. So if I go out for dinner, I will do like maybe a shrimp cocktail, which is usually very lean, or some oysters um, if I want to. And then I'll have like a nice serving of steak, you know, usually a strip loin. And then I'll have a side of uh, potatoes. It could be a baked potato, it could be French fries. If it, I do have French fries, which I love French fries. Um, if I do, I'll make sure I like take the correct amount of calories. Sometimes they have a huge portion, so I'll just take, I'll eyeball exactly what I think is the fair amount, and then I'll put away the rest. If I'm eating and I'm like, this is too much food, they gave me way too much of a portion, when I feel like it's time to stop eating, I'll put a napkin over the food so I'm not, because any food in front of me, I'm gonna keep picking on. It takes like, you know, I'll put a napkin over it. If you're not gonna have the bread, I'll tell them don't bring the bread because just having it there and not eating it depletes willpower. So if I go out for dinner, I pretty much just try and go straight to the jugular of what I'm going for, which is steak and some potatoes. I'll eat that and I won't touch crazy amounts of uh, vegetables, which are loaded in butter, salads. I'll just go straight for what I really want to eat. Um, and then if you're eating out a lot, it really helps to get those high amounts of steps in. So if you can just be very active, I mean, I did, I did about two weeks in Europe and I was eating out lunch, dinner every single day. And I actually got leaner on that trip. I lost like three pounds over two weeks. Um, and I just was getting in a ton of steps and I would just really, I just kind of eyeball it. And there's something where you can tell when you're eating a little bit too many calories. You can feel it in your body when you shift from a, being in a small deficit to being in a surplus. You can feel it when you go to bed at night. So you can kind of, you just got to listen to your body a little bit and then just eat the stuff that's going to fill you up the most and not take in extra calories that don't do much for you. So there's an ROI, there's a return on investment with your calories. And so some foods are low ROI. Having 500 calories in cauliflower when you're still gonna wanna eat the steak and potatoes is a low ROI thing. So I like to go straight for the juggler when I eat out. And then I can't, you have to eyeball it because it's, you're not gonna get perfect calorie readings. Even if you go out to dinner, even if you go to Chipotle and you get a, a bowl that says it's 800 calories, it could be anywhere from 800 to 1200. They can do bigger scoops of rice, so you really don't know. It, yeah. I have just launched my signature truffles with Thrive Market. So these are low sugar. In fact, they're actually keto friendly. They're sweetened with allulose, utilizing ethically sourced cacao, and also using hazelnut butter to give it a really well-rounded taste. So two different flavors. There is a hazelnut pecan crunch, which literally has a crunch to it. It's like velvety smooth, but then when you bite into it, you get the crunch in there as well. And a hazelnut mocha flavor for those that like that little coffee bite to it as well. So these things are completely low carb. There's only a tiny, tiny bit of sugar in them to begin with. The primary sweetener is allulose and everything else is ethically sourced. So I partnered it up with Thrive because We've worked on products together, but it was finally time for us to actually create a product that has the Tom Stelauer signature on it. So that link down below saves you 30% off your whole grocery order through Thrive Market, but you're more than welcome to apply that 30% off to these truffles as well, which are priced at 10.99, so they're not too bad to begin with, but then when you apply that 30%, it's even better. Plus, you get a free $60 gift whenever you sign up with Thrive Market as well. So that link is down below in the top line of the description underneath this video. Yeah, you, you hit on something that I think is really important, and we can kind of double click on it, was like you, you mentioned lean proteins, right? Yeah. And like I've been a huge proponent of lean proteins for a long time when I'm looking at meats, which came as a surprise to a lot of people because I came out of the low carb world and they're like, aren't you supposed to just support like fattier cuts of meat? And don't get me wrong, like I love yeah. a good ribeye and stuff like that, but like just that, right? Like if you go to a, a place and you have a, a scoop of white meat chicken versus dark meat chicken, people simply don't realize that you're talking double the calories in that sucker. And like, if it's gonna be swimming in sodium anyway, you're hardly gonna notice the difference. You might as well go for the leaner cuts, right? Mm -hmm. So like when you're at a restaurant and you're doing the, you know, you're getting maybe steak and potatoes, 
do you typically opt for like a filet or something that's leaner or do you just be like, hey, my calories are cool, I'm gonna go for the ribeye today? Yeah, I don't do the ribeye. It's, I don't really notice the bigger ROI getting a ribeye. Um, so the filet is gonna be on the leaner side for sure. Strip loin's sort of in the middle and then ribeye is quite fattier. And I find, honestly, I did a filet last night but I usually will go for the middle ground, the strip loin. And I, I've had ribeyes here and there, but to me, I, like a, I find the taste of a strip loin is much better. And then if you, if you do the ROI, if you do the math, having like, you know, the ribeye just has much more fat, more calories, and is it that much more satiating? For me, it's not. So I find the strip loin is like that nice balance. And then, and then I actually, you know, I, li I like filet too. Filet, strip loin. And then I think ribeyes usually, if you're getting in like 80 grams of protein, you're looking at at least 40, 45 grams of fat, which is yeah. you're taking in a lot of fat to kind of hit your hit hit the protein you want. Whereas a strip loin, if you're getting 80 grams of protein, it's probably going to be a little bit less, like 30 grams of fat, and then a fillet a bit leaner. So I find like the fillet and strip loin is really the go-to for sure. Yeah, man. No, I'm yeah. I'm with you on that. And like, yeah. and then even certain cuts of a new or types of a New York, and if you trim the fat off, it can be pretty lean too. Yeah, and you have to tell them like, if you're going out for dinner, you have to tell them don't put the butter on. Sometimes yeah. some restaurants will load up like 300 calories of butter, put it over the steak, it will drizzle in. That's why if you cook steak at home versus you go to a restaurant, like there's one dinner in my this one restaurant in in Miami, Prime 112. Every time I go for dinner there. I'll eat what would be like the same volume of food as if I would cook, but I'd leave and I'd feel so bloated and I'd feel like gross. And it was just because they put so much butter on the steak. Yeah. No, yeah. it tastes amazing, but it it's tastes just like amazing, up, right? It's like, it's, yeah. And then, I mean, where do you stand on, uh, like a lot of times, depending on where I'm at, like again, I tend to have rules myself. This is, is not the gospel. No one else needs to do this, but it's like, I say, okay, if I'm going to go out to eat and I feel like having a burger, you know, without the bun or something, that's typically going to be at the best in a restaurant, probably 80%, right? 80% lean. So it's going right. to be pretty high fat. Yeah. So if I know that it's like a lower quality restaurant that I'm at, I do ask them to cook it a little bit more well done too. So that it's Get at rid least of getting fat. rid of yeah. some of the fat. People don't realize that like if you put, you know, two identical burger patties together and you cook one at medium rare and one at Medium well. medium well or even well done but well done like i don't know it's a hockey puck at that point yeah. you know it's a pretty significant difference you can drop a good 10 or 15 grams of fat just by cooking that extra fat yeah. off so it's kind of a hot and if you weigh it food. after cooking you'll lose like an extra 10 percent of the weight yeah so if it's 300 grams medium uh rare it could go down quite a bit um being cooked more yeah so you know what i i just found that i played around with different i don't track my macros like perfectly, I kind of eyeball it, but I played around with different macro ratios and I've always come back to balance. So if I was to go out for dinner and eat pure chicken breast and a baked potato with no butter, I would be literally starving because my body would get in such a small amount of fat. So if I just had chicken breast rice or chicken breast baked potato, no fat, my body wouldn't get that, the, my brain wouldn't get the trigger uh, that you're full because it's so minimal amount of fat. Now, if I go to a restaurant, have a ribeye and, you know, a baked potato with butter, I'm taking a lot of calories. Do I need that much fat? It's sort of that middle ground, that middle ground where you get in like a balance of fat, protein and carbs, I found was the most satiating for me. Um, and so I, I kind of hit that, I try and hit that middle ground. Like I don't avoid fat. I don't, I don't welcome it like crazy. I just try and get that balance. And, and you know, for me, I didn't definitely did not like going super. In the fitness world, there's sort of this, and it's, it's kind of changed a little bit, but for the fitness world, there's been sort of, a lot of people fall into two different camps, anti-fat, anti-carb. Some people eat lots of protein and fat. Some people just want to avoid fat altogether. I played around with both and I never found either of those worked well. And I found a lower sex drive, lower testosterone. I found I was less satisfied. On both, right? Both. Yeah. Totally. So I, I kind of do the middle ground, you know? And I, I'll do a ribeye here and there, but like when I'm getting lean and locked in, I just, I just kind of go for what hits the spot for a little bit less fat. When you're yeah. getting you're getting some fat with your with your chocolate fix too, right? Yeah. Like you're getting good steric acid there, you're getting a good form of saturated fat. I was gonna circle back on that anyway, because I'm you and I share that. Like chocolate there's no way I'm getting that out of my diet. Like, <laughs> like I'm finding a way to get it in, right? Yeah. I will make room for it um, just because it's just, it does something. Like, I don't know 
what it is. I don't know if it's the specific macronutrients in it or if it's actually the theobromine and the other effects. But do you typically do, what do you do? Like 85%, 90% dark? Like what's your, what's your go-to with chocolate? I do, so you know, I used to do dark and I'm pretty sensitive to like caffeine. I'll yeah. have 300 milligrams a day and that's it. So if I was having dark chocolate at night, a little bit of caffeine would sometimes interfere with my sleep. So I just have like good milk chocolate. I like, to, I just kind of hit do what hits the spot. And I've always just been like, the, and this is the thing, right? Is that staying lean is hard. Let's face it, very few people can stay lean year round. Um, everyone wants to lose that extra five pounds, 10 pounds, could be 50 pounds. The reason the fitness industry is as big as it is is because people want to lose fat. They want to get leaner. That's the primary driver in fitness is, is fat loss. And the heart, where people struggle with is people struggle staying in a calorie deficit. And so I just made my kind of lens is how do we stay in a calorie deficit to strip off the fat we need? How do we make it enjoyable? And that's probably the biggest issue people have is sticking to a calorie deficit, is behavioral change. And so I actually just, I just kind of made the lens, how do I hit 22, 2300 calories a day consistently? And that little bit of milk chocolate at night hits the spot. I've played around with different, I rotate my dessert. Sometimes I'd have like a Magnum chocolate ice cream bar. I just, I give myself the last four or 500 calories, whatever I want. And, uh, but yeah, no, I don't do, I know dark chocolate has high amounts of magnesium. I know you have to be careful which dark chocolate you, you have because some are higher in heavy metals and stuff, but I just do milk chocolate. Yeah. No, I mean, you're going yeah. for enjoyment. You're not yeah, you're going for enjoyment. Yeah, you're yeah. not eating the chocolate. It's not because, strategic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and if you want to get, you know, granular with it, yeah, then you could start going down that rabbit hole. But yeah, that's what I found too. The super dark chocolate, I try to put earlier in the day anyway, just because right. I get amped up from it. Like I, I'm very sensitive to that caffeine as well. Now, yeah, it's, that's smart. I, I, you know, there's one point I would do, like a, I'd kind of have the chocolate earlier and, I, and, and all that. And then, you, yeah, then it works better to do the dark. You do 70% or? So, no, I mean, I'll, dude, I'll, I'll even be crazy sometimes and just do like straight up 100% dark without any sweet, but that's like utility. That's like pure right. utility. You know, usually I'm fine like in the 80 to 85%, right? Like that's yeah. usually seems to be a good spot. I'll try, um, I'll try a little dark chocolate kind of midday. You have yeah, it. Yeah, or that on. like that, and this isn't a plug for them, but that Hue yeah. chocolate or is it Who or however you say it, H U, yeah. uh, that chocolate, they've got some really good ones. It's like, yeah, it's like 85%, but it, the way that they, blended or whatever it tastes like milk so it's really creamy and it's sweetened with coconut sugar so it's a little bit like less refined so you feel a little Sick. bit um but okay you're obviously a big intermittent fasting guy as am i mm. do you train in a fasted state at all like do you do any cardio facet or do you just try to say hey i'm gonna get the majority of my steps in my fasted yeah. state do you not really pay attention to it too much anymore because you and i used to like, we both had fasting programs back in yeah. the day people thought that we were like um we had very similar views that we yeah. differed on a few things but you know, I've always been big on fasted workouts. It's just like a tool for me, but I wouldn't say it's the reason I stay lean. It just, I just feel better that way. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we did a pretty, pretty intense workout today. I did it fully fasted. I either train one of two ways. I either train fully fasted um, with just, you know, some caffeine before, or I will train before dinner, kind of be like, I'll train after a small meal. So I like to train relatively light. I don't like to have a, a thousand calories and then hit a workout. Um, so I'll usually have my training around noon or one o'clock fully fasted, um, or I will train sort of in the afternoon after a smaller meal of five, 600 calories. Um, those are like my two kind of styles. When I first really got into fasting, I think I trained years completely fasted and I, I loved it. If you're not used to training fasted, there's an adaptation to it, where some people are like, where do I get the energy? And then you, once you kind of get used to it, you kind of have this adrenaline and you have like really good workouts. Um, but if you're doing like, if you're training, some people are training for Ironmans, they're doing two, three hour workouts. If you're doing two hour workouts, you're gonna hit a wall. Like if I did like, when I sometimes I do like these longer kind of martial art, mixed martial art workouts, and there's a certain point where training fasted is counter counterproductive after 90 minutes of training you kind of can hit a wall but i do i do a mix what about uh when it comes down to your your training philosophy now to like to stay lean right because i think a lot of people look at this and say oh like these crossfit guys i mean they're training four hours a day and they they look amazing and they're lean and they're jacked so i guess i got to do that uh you know you and i talked a little bit about this but i think you know get down to the golden rules of like okay well what's 
like, how much do I need to train? Like, what does my cardio need to look like? What does my training need to look like to like maintain a physique like this year round? Yeah, yeah, CrossFit is interesting. If you look at the founder of CrossFit, he's not really an icon of fitness. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's not really a, I mean, you know, a CrossFit is, it's great for conditioning when you're, when you're doing a mix of, like the CrossFit workouts, I'll give them credit where credit's due. Those CrossFit workouts are brutal. I've done training like that. When I first started to get very into fitness, I followed this one guy that was did strength and conditioning for boxers, mixed martial artists, and we'd be doing burpees and pull-ups and weights back to back to back. And those workouts were exhausting. Um, but as far as building a great physique, it requires leanness and high amounts of strength. So for leanness, that's simply hitting your calories every day, getting in your steps, getting that 10, 12, or even 14,000 steps. And then for strength, I built my physique off doing three workouts a week, focusing on the key lifts, focusing on progressive overload. And when you combine getting very strong on key lifts, weighted pull-ups, incline press, with being lean, that's when I find, like that's the formula to looking very good. So I strip my training down to about three key lifts per week. Now I even train twice a week and then just really making sure I hit my calories and steps. If you wake up every day and you wanna do, you know, what are the checklists you must do to build a great body? Stick to the correct amount of calories. If you're in a calorie deficit, you know, you're gonna, if you're trying to get lean, that's calorie deficit. If you wanna put on size, you gotta eat a small surplus. So hit your calories and protein get your steps in every day and then hit your key workouts every week. If you do those three things, you're going to build an insane body. What's your, uh, like, what does your split look like these days? Like, what are those kind of three key lifts? Like, yeah. and you were, uh, you are saying something earlier about like sort of your strength of body weight ratio is really important, right? Because yeah. I think it's important to double down talking about that because people will get the wrong idea, right? If people are watching Stan Efforting squat, they're going to be discouraged because they're 180 pounds. Even if they're shredded, yeah. they're like, well, shoot, like Stan Efforting, you know, he's, he's squatting 800 pounds or whatever. Like that whole like strength to body weight ratio is really important. Like, yeah. so what do you focus on like improving your strength in what areas? Yeah, no, great question. And this is the, one of the themes in fitness is that people become goal hijacked. They start, they wake up, they want to build a lean, strong, natural looking athletic physique. And then they see power lifter, they see Olympic bodybuilder, and then they get goal hijacked. Then they want to become 220 pounds. You see this all the time, especially with younger men, guys that are 18 years old, 21 years old. They start off with the goal and then they follow some bodybuilder that's on high amounts of steroids and then they want to be 220 <laughs> or then they see some guy deadlift 600 pounds they want to deadlift 600 pounds no don't get goal hijacked stay on the goal so as far as my split is when i'm training three days a week i do monday and friday are upper body days one day i'll focus more on horizontal pushing so chest uh, with some arms rear delts the other day i'll focus more on shoulder presses with some back a little extra tricep um, and then wednesday is for legs and I actually like to train my traps after legs. I really like to kind of finish off leg days with some, with some shrugs. So those are my three kind of workouts. And then, you know, on the Monday, for example, my key lift will really be the incline bench. I'll really try and hit some PRs incline bench. I'll also hit some, some heavy curls. Um, and I'll do other exercises, but those are kind of like the, the main lifts I'm kind of trying to progress on. On the Friday, it's kind of getting stronger on shoulder presses and weighted pull-ups. And then on the Wednesday, I don't do crazy heavy squats or deadlifts. Um, with my leg training, the goal is just to have some strength and proportion. So I like to do kind of Bulgarian split squats, Romanian deadlifts. Um, and I find that when, you know, if you're really trying to long-term push crazy heavy squats and deadlifts, there's a higher likelihood of injury. And it's not that necessary for building a great natural looking physique. So I have my clients do uh, Bulgarian split squats, Romanian deadlifts, maybe a little extra um, leg extensions or some knees over toes stuff, and that's pretty much it. Um, but if you can just get strong on incline press, weighted pull-ups, and shoulder press, you're gonna build that kind of coveted V-shape, that Hollywood physique. And you know, if you can build up to 100 pound incline dumbbell presses, get strong on, and hitting 80, 90 pound weighted pull-ups or chin-ups, your physique's gonna look awesome. And so the goal is, every single week as you're building up to your muscle mass goals you want to be able to add a rep here you know you hit you hit eight reps and you want to add five pounds and you always want to be pushing and so for me i found that when i did a lot of high volume it became harder for me to hit those consistent prs when i stripped away to like just the core the lower volume approach 
I just found my strength went through the roof. And people have different experiences. So I recommend doing what works best for you. My main thing for anyone listening is simply the question is if you're making progress on your routine, if you're coming in each week and you're adding that one rep. Now, obviously, you've been training for 15 years. You're not going to be able to consistently hit PRs year round. But, you know, when you're building up to your goal physique, are you adding those reps? Are you adding the weight? If you are, keep doing exactly what you're doing. And then if you hit that plateau and you're, if you're having a struggle, then it's time to try something different. It's interesting, man. I mean, you like when you talk about training intensity, one of the things that I've, I've noticed too is that if I start increasing my volume too much, it's harder and harder to get into a deficit, right? It's like, because I end up hungry, right? I've found like, I, I am always trying to find like at my stage of training, what is that sweet spot? Because if I push it a little too far, A, my recovery goes to crap, but more importantly, it pushes me over the edge to where I'm more hungry and it's harder and harder to maintain that deficit that I like to be in. So it sounds like you found sort of that, that sweet spot. And I, I have to kind of check myself sometimes too, because I get hooked on doing these monster Metcons that just, they feel good, in the short term but then it's like three hours later you're ravenous and it's hard to maintain because you just have all these signals telling you to eat 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 yeah my leanest you know and i post some boxing videos when i was doing like some intense boxing two days a week i actually was less lean i, I would need to eat more um, but my leanest i've ever been was literally doing walking so i'd get 10 12 000 steps a day and i would either do two lifts per week or three very minimalist lifts of three to four exercises per workout, two to three sets. Like my leanest has always been doing the absolute bare minimum because my appetite is lower. When I train more and I do longer workouts um, or I add in some boxing, I, my body needs more. When you, when you train more, you also create a, you know, a re recovery deficit. And so you need more calories. And so the leanest and sharpest I've ever looked has been training a lot less than people think. And I and I like to train, so I like to add in the box and stuff like that. Um, but then, you know, you definitely need to bring in more calories. Yeah, it's fine. I find that I'm the same way. Like I love training and walking has been the same way for me to kind of almost get my mind off of training in a way, because yeah. it's like, if I was left to my own devices, I'd be like, I'm gonna go to the gym again and do it again. But I know that it's not realistic. So, okay, I'm gonna go for a walk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill that time a different way Pass, you know, I feel like I've got a level of, I mean, this term is thrown around, but I kind of joke about it, you know, almost this like ADD, right? Where it's like, I have to be doing something. I have to be, I'm either going to be training or I'm going to be working on the business or this or that. Mm -hmm. So if I get the itch to say, oh, I need to go do a double day. I need to train again. I know in my heart that that's not the best choice, right? It's almost a bad addiction that puts me back there. So I say, you know what? Check it, go for a walk, you know, 30 minute walk, 60 minute walk, knock out some phone calls, knock out that stuff. I'm like, you know what? good. I didn't need to train again. And I actually end up looking better as a result, just simply going for that walk. And this is kind of like the Western mentality, you know, the American mentality that you want to push yourself all the time. You, you, you know, pay, no pain, no gain. And you have to kind of pull it back a little bit. And so I've always, you know, the one thing that is ex extremely important, whether you're trying to improve in fitness in business and relationships or any sort of pillar of life is you want to track your progress and track what you're doing and you'll see what works. You'll see what doesn't. So I've tracked every single workout. It used to be in a spiral bound book. Now it's in my phone, but I've tracked every single workout and I've seen what works and what doesn't. And I've hit plateaus and I've played around with different things and I've really come to the thesis that recovery is key and less is more. And again, if you're gonna push yourself really hard and fight for that last rep, um, there's gonna be a cost and you're gonna need to give your body that, that rest to come back stronger. No, definitely agree, man. And I'm, before we uh, wrap this one up, I wanna yeah. pivot over to supplementation for just a minute. Is there anything yeah. that you focus on as far as like core supplementation? Not necessarily for staying lean, because I know that might be a bit contrived to say. Like I know right. like there's no supplement that's gonna make you stay under 10% body fat per se, but are there any core pillars that you have? Yeah, so once you have your nutrition dialed, you're hitting the correct amount of calories and protein, your training's dialed, you're getting in your steps, there's a few key supplements that can, you know, be beneficial. Um, for me, what I take is when I've, you know, there's one supplement that is a bit controversial, but this is one that's been helpful for me is when I want to cut below 10% body fat, 
I found taking essential amino acids help mm -hmm. with preventing protein breakdown and they have a hunger blunting effect. So if, if, you know, it's, if I wake up at nine in the morning, you know, sometimes you're getting really lean around 12, one o'clock before I train, I'll take EAAs. And I find that kind of, that helped my physique, helped my body composition. Um, so that's one. Um, now the big issue that we're seeing uh, more than ever is men's testosterone levels are lower than they used to be. They're 30, 40% lower than men in the eighties. And so um, one of the supplements that I use is a, it's a mix of magnesium, zinc, boron, three minerals that support testosterone and, uh, and two key herbs, Tongatali and Forskali. And I use that. And one of the cool benefits is when you're in a prolonged deficit, you can see a drop in sex drive. You can kind of, your libido can go down. And so those support your testosterone levels and increase your libido. Um, but, um, and as far as a protein supplement, I've always liked collagen protein because collagen protein is very, very filling. So I would, during, when I'm cutting, I will take like a scoop of collagen, mix it in um, hot water and I'll sip on that, or I'll mix uh, collagen in like Greek yogurt. It's this delicious pudding that's high in protein. So I kind of, I, for protein, that's what I kind of go for. I find collagen is more filling for me than whey. Um, and, but again, there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people that want to like, oh, I got to have a protein shake right after training. I have this 200 calorie protein shake before. And a lot of that actually just kind of ends up not supporting fat loss because you're taking in the, these calories that aren't very filling. But for me, the collagen, you sip on a hot collagen mixed in hot water, it's like 80 calories and it is more filling. Um, so there's not too much for fat loss, but I, did, I do find those, those few are effective. Yeah, the collagen thing, that's a cool trick, man, because yeah. like a lot of times when people have a whey protein shake, it satiates you in the short term, but there's, it's so insulinogenic. It does cause a pretty big insulin spike just because it absorbs so fast. Yeah. So then like a lot of times people find an hour later, they're pretty ravenous, whereas the collagen is much less insulinogenic. So people do tend to find that. That's why uh, yeah. like people even sipping on bone broth, for example, like super high gelatin and collagen, it's like, it just satiates you and you feel like you got something. So I have a very similar thing. I sip on bone broth. Like if I get hungry and I know that I need to be in a deficit, I'll do the same thing. I'll sip, and sip on bone broth for that exact reason. It's something about, I think it's the gelatin in it. It, it yeah, probably thickens, it's viscous. And, and it, it's, um, you know, there's not a lot of literature to back it up, but it's like sometimes this anecdotal stuff is what it takes. It's like if I drink, and I love whey protein, don't get me wrong. Like if I drink a whey protein shake versus a collagen shake, I will absolutely like undoubtedly be more satiated after the collagen for sure. Um, and my only guess is it has to do with the, you know, the insulinogenic nature think, of it. Yeah, no, I think you're right about that for sure. And this is something that everyone, I, again, my kind of big lesson is test everything for yourself. Don't just take my word as the voice of God, put it to the test, have a waist shake, have a collagen, you know, at the end of the day, you got to test it for yourself. But I do find the collagen is far more filling. Um, but you know, so yeah, some stuff to support your testosterone, um, and sex drive during cut is helpful. The collagen is helpful and I've gotten lean without using any essential amino acids. I've gotten lean with, and I did see a small benefit for those that if you're cutting to if your goal is to get the 15% body fat, it doesn't matter if you're cutting below 10%. See the issue with cutting to a low body fat is that there's always going to be increased risk of muscle loss. It's very hard to hold a lot of muscle at a low body fat. That's also why you're not going to see naturals walking around at 210 pounds, 510 shredded. There's a, there's anabolic support that. So trying to hold on to all your strength and muscle while getting lean is sort of, is sort of the goal. And that's a hard thing to do. No, agreed, yeah. man. Well, uh, Greg, where can everyone find you, man? And like, where can they get your, your program and all that as well? Yeah. So you can search two, two places. My website is kinobody.com, K-I-N-O body. Kino kind of translates in German to movie body. So the movie star body. And then my Instagram is Greg O'Gallagher. Right on, man. Well, as always, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks. Bob. Awesome. Thanks, man, for having me.